Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Engaging Students in Research Methods, How to Utilize Activities and Projects for Skill-Based Learning, presented by Springer Publishing Company and featuring Dr. Amy Eiler, the author of the forthcoming textbook, Research Methods for Public Health, which will publish this month. My name is David Diadana, and I am the senior editor responsible for the public health and Health Administration Publishing Programs here at Springer Publishing. For those who do not know much about Springer Publishing Company, we are an independent publisher known for innovative textbooks, professional references, and clinical products in the fields of nursing, behavioral and health sciences, and medicine. Before I introduce Dr. Eiler, please note that this webinar will be recorded, disseminated, and posted on our website in case you miss any part of the presentation. And we will also be taking a few questions at the end of the presentation from the audience and through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please feel free to send along any questions as we go during the presentation itself. I am pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Eiler. Amy Eiler is an associate professor in the graduate program of public health in the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. She currently chairs the Public Health Sector Standing Committee of the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan. She was the past chair of the Physical Activity Section of the American Public Health Association, a member of the American College of Sports Medicine, and is the Certified Health Education Specialist. She has an extensive publication record, including as a co-editor to the textbook Physical Activity and Public Health Practice, published in 2019 by Springer Publishing, which received a Prose Award honorable mention in the public health category. She also has published the 2016 book entitled Prevention, Policy, and Public Health by Oxford University Press. Dr. Eiler's main research interests are health promotion through community policy and environmental interventions, with a focus on physical activity and obesity prevention. She has a master's degree in physical education and adult fitness from Ohio University and a doctorate in public health from Oregon State University. And here is a reminder of today's agenda. And with that, I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Eiler. Amy, please take it away. Thanks, David. Research methods is taught in many different academic programs. To get started, let's get a sense of the disciplines represented on this call. Our first poll question is, in what discipline do you teach? Great, it looks like we have a good representation here uh, with public health and health sciences making up the majority of the audience. So I will tailor my discussion uh, to, to that poll response. So why research methods? After over a decade of teaching this class, I have come to realize that people need to know its importance and where it fits in, in these different disciplines. So first, research builds evidence. Evidence-based interventions are those which are deemed most effective. We know they work because of the research upon which they are based. And without research, we would not have this evidence. And if we know it works, we can make the best use of available and often limited resources when we're planning interventions. Research also builds practice and influences what is practiced. Sometimes students don't see the value in learning research. I often experience this in my class with students going into social work practice. I had to convince them that what they're doing with their clients and in their practice will be based on evidence and that they should know how that evidence is created and why they might be doing one intervention or one type of practice over another. Knowing about research methods really helps inform this. Research is also really important to advocacy, which is so apparent in, in these current times. Students need to understand not only the research process, but also how to interpret and communicate findings in ways that different groups can understand. For example, research results might be important to convince a community about a health concern and that it even exists, exists in their community, or a policymaker might need to know the components of a policy that would make the greatest impact. Research can help. 
And also knowing about research makes us better consumers. We're inundated with information and different claims daily. Depending on the day in the news, things like coffee or alcohol changes from being good or bad for you. Students need to know how to scrutinize what they read and be able to discern good research from bad research. And that's where research methods comes in. And finally, for those of you who teach in an accredited public health program, the Council on Education for Public Health foundational competencies align with many concepts taught in a basic research methods class with my text. The instructor will have to know these competencies and demonstrate how you assess them with your students. This text outlines them in detail and provides assessment suggestions, which is super helpful when you're going up for accreditation. Here's an example of how the foundational competencies fit. So there is a competency related to communication and it states uh, select students should know how to select communication strategies for different audiences and sectors. The topic within research methods, which is often eliminated from other texts is dissemination, what you do after you do the research and how you interpret, interpret and share those results. And an activity that's related is you have students develop a detailed dissemination plan using the information from the text and applying that learning into this activity and then being able to assess that activity to report back to CEIF as a foundational competency assessment. So now we'll talk about engaging students with skill-based learning. Anyone who teaches now knows that engaging students can be quite a challenge. So skill-based learning is something that we can do to help students stay involved in learn and demonstrate the skills that they learn. Let's take another poll. What platforms do you currently teach or will you teach this year? Great. Looks like the majority of people are teaching either on online or hybrid. I know I'm teaching two hybrid courses this year as well. Let's dive a little deeper into skill-based learning and how it fits with research methods class. We're going to talk about why skill-based learning is, or what it is, why it's so important, why implement, and why it's important in public health and other related disciplines. So first, what is skill-based learning? It really has four main components. First, delivering the information the learner needs to know. Sort of the big what. What do they need to know in order to be able to apply it? Next, providing an opportunity for the learner to apply that information. Not just rotely recite it, but really making an opportunity to reflect a real-world application. And after students apply skills, the instructor provides feedback on this application, both about the process of completing the skill and also its content. So why should we use this in research methods? First, the, the concepts are pretty complex, especially related to public health and health sciences. Almost every chapter in this research methods book could probably be elaborated to fill a, a different textbook in and of itself. Also, student, students come to this class with varied experience and interests. Skill-based learning can really be adapted to this varied skill level. Another good thing about this method is that you could draw upon what they learn in this class and transfer it to other courses. This is particularly relevant in public health programs where they go on to take other courses that they'll use these basic research skills for. All right, let's take another poll. How might skill-based learning techniques fit with your teaching? Great, it looks like either people are currently using or planning or considering to use this method in their classes. That's great, the next examples will be really helpful. Now let's talk about the benefits of using a text that connects with these activities and help with skill-based learning. First of all, Gen Z students, the majority of the students in academic programs now, 
are less likely to learn from straight lectures and class readings. They're used to varied ways of receiving information and really prefer a hands-on approach. Skill-based learning is also highly adaptable to different learning platforms. For example, this, this semester I'm teaching a hybrid class. I post my lectures online, and then we do all the skill-based learning activities in person. So they demonstrate the skills, and then I can provide feedback about the process and content of what they're learning. Now I'll give you a couple examples. So this is an example of a, a chapter in the book. It's public health research ethics, which is also a core competency for public health. So the skill that we want students to leave with is they need a, a core understanding of the components of human subjects protection and really how to assess research studies to make sure that they fit within these required components. So an activity related to this concept would be a mock institutional review board where students actually can review and critique a study to see if it meets the core components of human subjects protection. So going back to those four components of skill-based learning, the knowledge. The knowledge in the text provides historical context of, of public health ethics, regulations, some really important terms they need to know, and the context of ethical considerations. The skill application would be students learn these definitions and then apply them to a specific critique of a research study. Real life example is using an actual aim page from a proposed study where they can look at real life research and what an actual research would, researcher would propose and how it could be critiqued by a, a, an actual institutional review board. Then the feedback coming, coming together as a class and discussing the process of the review um, and, and the content of the review and would they approve the study or not and why that provides really really important feedback to this activity so you can see how it meets the four components of skill-based learning and connects back to the text here's another example so the concept is data collection through observation data collection is a huge part of the research process and the skill of learning how to operationalize, sort of define and measure what you're studying and observe is an important skill. And the activity would be an actual op observation of place. So once again, going back to those four components of skill-based learning, the text provides information on operationalization and measurement. So how do you define concepts? How do you define them in a way that they can be measured? Students often have great ideas about what to study, but then they struggle in how to define it and how to make it measurable. So a skill application is they have to develop operational def definitions and measurement strategies for a team observation task. I typically send students around campus, giving them a specific research question and a place to go observe either people or interactions or different aspects of the environment. And they could use these applicable actual concepts in a real time observation recording. And then we all come back together as a class and talk about the process. Was it difficult? Did you agree on how to define these different aspects that you're measuring? And then how, how difficult was the whole process in coming up with the observation techniques? So this is just another example of a way to connect information in a text with an activity with those core competencies and then a way to assess and make sure the students can leave this research methods class with these skills. What type of skill based learning activities would you most likely use in your class. Great, it looks like research projects, scenarios, hands-on discussions, those are our hands-on activities. Those are all ways that we can get the students to take the information that we provide to them and apply it. A lot of research methods class require a research project. And in my text, there's a research project check-in at the end of every chapter that aligns with whatever the content of that chapter is. 
Also, scenarios with discussion are a great way to emphasize skill-based learning. They let students apply to not a hands-on experience, but reading a scenario where they can assess uh, and really provide answers some, to some critical thinking questions uh, and talk about it as a group and where the instructor could provide feedback about these skills. So to summarize, skill-based learning is important for research methods in public health and other disciplines. The book complements text information with instructor resources for skill building, but also how to assess those activities in a way that they can re be reported back to accreditation bodies. Now it's time for questions. I'll give it back to David. Thanks, Amy, so much. Um, we do have a few that came through. Um, the first question goes back to the SEAT competencies. Um, how does the book address or connect with the SEAT competencies? That's a great question. Every chapter at the beginning of, or at the end of every chapter, it lists which uh, foundational knowledge or competencies align with the chapter. And then the activities that are provided as instructor resources uh, also do the same thing. And the syllabus that's provided lists all the competencies and the potential activities that you can do to assess those competencies. Okay, great. And is that for both undergraduate and graduate? Uh, it, it is mainly geared toward an MPH program, but we did provide a sample syllabus for a baccalaureate degree in public health as well. Great. Have some other questions here. Um, okay, this person is teaching a research methods course that has students from different degree programs. What recommendations do you have for connecting the textbook with skill based activities? Um, that would be helpful for public health and related areas. I think at Brown School, this might be applicable. Right, yeah, this happens a lot. We have not only social work and public health, but we also have joint degrees with business and, and have other students from across campus uh, take our classes. So I'm very familiar with this. I do an assessment of student interest at the beginning of the semester. And then with all the, the examples that we use or a lot of the activities that are recommended in the instructor resources, they could be tailored to student interests. So for example, in an activity where you learn about external validity, the articles, the peer reviewed articles that you choose that the students can assess for these components of external validity can be taken from a, bro a broad variety of journals to make sure that they match the, um, the student interest. Uh, yes, back to the class activities. Um, you mentioned that there are components in, in the chapters. How many class activities come with the textbook and give um, uh, in the ancillaries or in the textbook itself? So there's one to two per chapter of the book and there's 15 chapters. So some, some chapters have a selection, you can choose whatever fits, and then some there's just one that really covers the core concept of the chapter. And are there examples in the book or ancillary materials of how they can be tailored, going back to, I guess, your poll, you know, on hybrid courses or online courses? Um, are there any uh, examples in those materials that you can tailor further based on those learning platforms? I, I think uh, definitely with, especially with, we've come a long way since spring with Zoom. And instead of doing a small group in a in-person class, you could do a breakout room on Zoom and the activities would be similarly relevant by doing it that way. Uh, this course at Washington University is being taught in both fully online and hybrid classes, but we're using the same um, same text and curriculum, and it's working well both ways. Okay, great. Um, I have I have a, actually a question myself. Um, during I guess the pandemic, what are you noticing? Any um, I guess specific questions from students that are informing your teaching and how to teach research methods? Um, you know, I think what has happened for me from going in in person to this hybrid, um, that it works well, that recording lectures is much easier and much easier to engage students than standing in front of the class. So I record lectures in small chunks 
and then we do all the in-person activities in class and it it really uh I, I feel as if I would like to teach this way all the time because I think it's more effective. The students stay more engaged. Great. Um, we do have a question on how to um, get an instructor copy, which we will cover um, in the coming slides here. Um, but I do want to give some time for other questions related to the book content as well. Um, if you have any questions, please send them over through the Q&A. Uh, feature in Zoom, um, and we'll give you a, a few seconds now um, to do so. Um, I, I did want to mention one more thing. It's the adaptability, and uh, it won't grow old because especially the, in the instructor resources, there's ways to keep it current. Uh, for example, for some of the activities, I chose articles on COVID. So uh, instead of using smoking cessation or something I might have used in the past, you can replace it with more current articles and more appropriate topics. Okay, great. I'm going to give another 10 to 15 seconds for more questions if there are any. Okay, I guess we should go to the next slide, Amy, and see um, or show how we can Get this book in people's hands. Um, so thanks for joining us. Here's a way to you know get a copy of the book for um, to to uh, review and consider for adoption. You can visit us at www.springerpub.com slash Eiler for more information, um, including how to get the instructor's materials, including the test bank. PowerPoints, sample syllabi, and the instructor's manual. And you can also um, feel free to send questions or comments through email um, to www.springerpub.com slash educators um, and find your sales rep in your region of the country. We will also be sending a survey through SurveyMonkey to attendees after the webinar. So we greatly appreciate your input on how we did and uh, what other information or webinars you would like to see in the future. Um, I guess that is all for today. Thank you so much. Um, oh, I do have a question. Will the e-text be available? Yes, we will um, be able to send you uh, e-sample uh, copies uh, to review for your course. And we'll also, you know, have um, print copies if, if needed for you um, to send out um, if you fill out the information on our website about your course and contact the sales rep. Um, so we look forward to um, sending these adoption request copies out for your review, and we hope you like the book. Um, please stay safe and well during this unprecedented time. And thank you to all um, the healthcare workers on the front lines. Um, out there and those supporting them. And that includes a lot of people, I'm sure, um, on this uh, webinar today, um, but also people that you know. So please give them love. Um, they've done a lot for us. Um, thanks again and take care.